Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Call the health committee meeting to order, March 7, 9.47 a.m. All members present, Les Kokenauer and Taggart, Thursday. Are there any public comments? Moving on to the agencies reporting. There are none. So we can hear from the Iroquois County Public Health Department and D. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I thought I'd start out by giving you just a little bit of a state budget update. Um, the Illinois Department of Public Health fiscal year 18 budget um, was set at $570 million, which is down 2.3% from fiscal year 17. Um, IDPH has a relatively small amount of GRF. About 20% of its budget is general revenue. The remainder mm-hmm. is a mix of both federal and other state funds. Director Shaw presented the fiscal year 18 budget to um, public health administrators and advocates um, a, a few weeks ago. I did go to Springfield for that. This budget represented um, his priorities um, and um, had an increase of $1.6 million for opioid over- overdose prevention. Currently, the Illinois Department of Public Health doesn't have any kind of an opioid prevention program, so he has appropriated $1.6 million for that program. What that will mean for local health departments in each county, we don't know yet. So we'll, we're waiting to, um, you know, to get further information. Um, but it is definitely something that's needed in many, many counties. Um, Two million dollars um, of that budget increase um, the Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Prevention Program. They've been telling us for years that that program was probably going to go away. We um, felt that it was a priority and has appropriated $2 million in increased funding for the Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Program. We do have that program in Newport County. Not all counties have that. We do have that county program. We actually subcontract that program from Livingston County. They're the grantee and we're um, a sub a sub grantee. So, um, so Livingston County signs that contract with the state, and we provide those services under their umbrella. <coughs> Excuse me. There was also a three million dollar adjustment in the HIV um, program. Um, we still are referring all of our HIV cases to Champaign County. Um, we have a partnership with them. Um, and the um, Champaign County Health Department, ha- Champaign Urbana Public Health District, has been very, um, very easy to work with and very willing to um, serve Iroquois County residents. And um, they have a wonderful program, a wonderful program. So if someone needs to be tested or has been exposed or um, just has general concerns about whether or not they could be HIV positive, they have a full staff that, um, that does testing on site. Um, they can get an immediate result and then they send off uh, assessment for, confirm- for confirmatory testing, but they have a wonderful program that, um, that really doesn't cost our county anything to participate with them. So they've been a huge benefit to us. Um, the governor has recommended um, $50 million of that um, fiscal year budget go in go into um, full construction grant to assist in lead abatement. We do lead screenings here at our health department, and um, we do participate in lead um, um, investigations. Um, but there will be some funding, according to what we've been told. There will be some funding, not only for um, schools who who um, are tested and found to have lead in their you know, water or in their um, buildings, um, there will also be approximately $30 million for the removal of lead sources from a residence where a child has elevated blood levels of lead exposure. So they're also going to provide some funding to help these families um, who have 
kids with high lead levels um, and mitigate that problem in their home. We'll see what happens with all that. That's, that's all new. So um, that's, all, that's the, about the max of what we've been told about that. So we'll see as um, further information is made available to us how that's going to fall out for Iroquois County and, and what that will mean that we'll, our health department will be doing. But I will keep you informed. Um, otherwise, um, you know, they're talking about the budget for 18 and there's still no budget for 16 or 17, so that's, I find that very interesting. Um, for the IMH sub-awarding program for WIC, um, that's our only sub-awarded program that we have still, um, that we sub-award to the hospital is just WIC. Um, as you know, Family Case Management and Healthy Families Illinois we did not apply for those grants and they did and, and received them, so they're, they're the direct grantees now. But for WIC, um, we will have, be having a WIC review. Um, the auditors will be here uh, on the 28th and 29th of March. We have already done the pre-assessment form and the pre-visit form and um, Ellen completed those and um, I sent those in, so we're um, just waiting. Um, for the visit to come. Her caseload, the assigned caseload for WIC for Iroquois County is 586. Um, her caseload for January was 404. Um, she's still tallying her February numbers. But we usually don't get those until about the 15th of the month. Um, so they're running about 69%. Actually, believe it or not, 69% is not too bad. Um, most um, County even theater below that. Ellen did um, write a note, some notes, so I will I will read what she wrote. Uh, the January 2017 caseload reported 69 percent. We've been told that many people are getting increases in SNAP, um, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and do not want to follow up with WIC because they have to attend appointments every two to three months. So they're relying on the food pantry and SNAP for groceries. Um, the other reason uh, statewide um, that WIC is declined, the WIC numbers of caseloads are declining across the state is because a lot of pediatricians are still recommending that babies get 2% milk and WIC will only um, assist with 1% milk and the pediatricians are telling them that these babies need that fat, fat content and they, and they do. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's another reason that WIC is is um, dropping down because WIC is, you know, people are choosing to follow their pediatrician's advice, mm -hmm. which is understandable. Mm -hmm. um, they have a new nurse that's being trained. Um, Marilyn Schomburg um, was working a couple days a week during the WIC and she has decided to retire from WIC. She's still going to be working at your friend Memorial Hospital. Um, Ellen wanted to make sure that um, we noted that um, Marilyn Schomburg um, served either full or part-time for 35 years in WIC services. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. So we wish her well and thank her for her years of service. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we are with WIC. Um, and then on to the summary report program for our program. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so under the environmental section, if you have any questions, let me know. Obviously, you realize that you know most of our permits were issued in December. That's when we issue all the standing permits. Um, so then during the rest of the year, um, it's usually just um, new permits and, and um, revision or reopening or that kind of thing. There were 66 tobacco compliance in inspections. We gave out 15 radon kits, um, 10 um, garbage waste hauler truck inspections were completed. Um, you can see that we only have a few wells. Usually during the winter months, you don't see a lot of wells because the ground's so hard. Mm -hmm. Um, on the end, if you flip to page two under community, under the immunizations, I did want to point this out to you. 
that last year in 2017, in January, we gave 33 childhood immunizations. We gave 82 this year in January. Last year, in February, we gave 39, and this year we gave 85. So our immunizations are more than doubling. That is because, um, and I think I discussed this with you a little bit last month, your Cremamar Hospital Clinic, mm -hmm. Kentland, Milford, Watsika, Gilman, they're all um, giving up their immunization programs and referring their clients to the health department. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see big increases of that. Um, you'll probably see that I will be over budget on ordering vaccines. Um, that's expected. Um, but um, it'll, uh, I think, balance work out. Um, since I can overspend because of the solar lobby anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did want to make, to make a note that, you know, they're more than doubling. And I expect that to, I expect to see that going forward. Um, under the influenza-like illness outbreak, um, I do want you to know that we did have, that, w that particular outbreak, we had six people, it was a big outbreak actually. Um, in a long-term care facility. But we asked for six specimens. So we did six nasal swabs. So one of them came back positive for influenza. The rest of them came back negative. Not positive that we were looking at an influenza case and, and the state didn't call it influenza. They called it an influenza-like outbreak. But what I have been hearing from local physicians' offices is that their nasal swabs are coming back um, positive for RSV. So RSV, even in adults, um, you know, is is um, prevalent in the county right now. RSV, um, the RSV is not reportable by law to your local health department. So we do not need, have to know about those cases unless um, it involves an outbreak, for example, in school or in a long-term care facility. Respiratory. Yeah, RSV is the um, respiratory syncytical virus and it is a virus that um, mimics pneumonia symptoms. Um, it's very, um, it's very, it can, it can be very dangerous for children um, because they have weakened immune systems or uh, not as strong as immune systems as adults. Usually adults can get it, RSV, um, get over it very quickly, have more mild symptoms than the children do and um, um, don't seem to have the complications as far as hospitalizations and so forth. Um, but you can get pretty sick and feel pretty bad and it's a virus and, you know, antibiotics don't work on a virus, so. <coughs> but I, I wanted to let you know about that one. Um, and then our senior service numbers, if you look on the next page, um, I do want to point out that typically every year, and I look back, typically, and I even brought last year's in case anybody, I think I did, yeah, here I did, in case anybody wants to look at it, typically our senior service numbers peak in March and April. We're not sure why. Luann doesn't know why, I don't know why, we don't know why, but typically every year we seem to have a, a surge in adult protective service cases in March and April. Is it related to people getting tax refunds and, and family members trying to get a hold of it? Or, you know, we don't know. We, we, don't, we don't know. So um, we hate to say that. But um, I will be watching those numbers very closely because um, I have been discussing with the Board of Health at our January meeting and our March 1st meeting. I discussed in detail with them. In fact, in the, at the January meeting, I had Luann come and do a little presentation on our senior service program mm -hmm. and the changes that are coming with that. There are going to be a lot of changes. We've been told that they'll start implementing those changes in April of this year. Mm -hmm. um, we have not received notification of when, you know, exactly when they're coming yet, but we were told that's when to start expecting them to start coming. Those changes are going to really change our program because it will change the number of visits that we're allowed to do, um, the follow-up visits. It will change um, rescreening. It will change everything. I expect that our numbers will drop in half eventually. So right now we have two full-time and one part-time people working in, on those programs. Um, 
in the senior service programs, including CCP, with the APS numbers dropping and the CCP numbers dropping, um, we're, I'm going to be evaluating whether we need um, that part-time person or not. Mm -hmm. In order to hold the program, you have to legally have two full-time people because you have to have a uh, supervisor and a caseworker in order to have the program. So we would never be able to, to um, be granted the program without having two full-time workers. But um, the need for the, the part-time person will fluctuate. Um, what we'll do as we start to see that, um, if we start to see, if we start to see those numbers go down, now, remember I just told you, in March and April they typically go up. So we, we're going to have, probably have to wait to see what happens after that. Mm -hmm. But if we do, then um, the person that's doing that is working three days a week. Um, we would cut them to two, and then if we needed to, we'll, you know, but um, mm -hmm. we'll make that decision as, as, um, as need to be made. But I have been um, speaking with the Board of Health about that, um, so that they're aware of, of what changes are coming. Do you have any other questions about this report? There's a lot of things on this yeah. report. You know, I know when you look at the sheriff's report and you see the number of inmates, and, you know, you get all that, but typically, you, a lot of people don't see all that we do, and I think that it might surprise them. Okay, um, the next thing is your grants and contracts. I think the only update I have on your grants and contracts work was, the only change from last month is um, that on February 7th, we signed the tanning, we, we received the contract number for the tanning program. So otherwise, we have contract numbers for everything now. Took all year to get them. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Um, some upcoming things I told you about the writ review that's coming out. The only other thing I really wanted to take a minute and discuss with you is the Illinois Association of Public Health Administrators is having a leg legislative reception um, and capital action day on April 5th and 6th. That's where we have a chance to sit down at the table with some of the legislators and really discuss some of the bills that are involving public health. Um, it is a good networking opportunity. <coughs> I've sent invitations to um, Tom Bennett, to Adam Kinzinger, to um, um, Jason Berrickman. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Bennett last year attended with me. Mm -hmm. um, he's always been very open and very willing to hear what we um, are concerned with as far as legislation and public health. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of public health bills. Um, I belong to, you know, I'm in the Illinois Department of Public Health um, Legislative Committee. Um, there are eight of us, and we go over these bills and discuss them and research them a little bit. The one that has me most concerned right now is probably going to be heard today in the House, and that is House Bill 2466. And House Bill 2466 um, seeks to remove the prohibition of off-farm sales and would facilitate a change to the current rules to allow widespread retail distribution of raw milk. So right now, currently, um, in 2016, um, after about two years of, of extensive debate, um, the administrative rules change to allow um, provisions for off-farm sales. At that point in time, the health department had no problem with that. Um, if someone wants to go to a farmer's farm and buy raw milk and drink that, then so be it. Um, you know, and, and, you know, they can do that. They, they can do that. What this provision is, what this bill is trying to do is um, allow it to be sold at you know, farmers markets, at the grocery store, local grocery stores, all that kind of stuff. Well, it all sounds good because everybody likes the word natural, they like the word organic, but pasteurization, pasteurization came into um, fruition for valid reasons, and those reasons are still valid today. So I just want to read off a few facts for the record um, about raw milk. 
the, first of all, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the American Medical Association strongly advise against human consumption of raw milk since it may contain a wide variety of harmful bacteria, mm. including Salmonella, E. coli, O157, Listeria, Campylobacter, and Brucella that may cause illness and possibly death. Because of the potential for serious illness, federal law prohibits dairy from distributing raw milk across state lines in final package form, um, meaning that raw milk can only be distributed across state lines if it's going to be pasteurized or used to make aged or over 60 days cheese before being sold to consumers. States that allow the legal sale of raw milk for human consumption have more than twice the rate of raw milk related outbreaks of illnesses mm. than states that do not allow raw milk to be sold legally. The rate of outbreaks caused by raw or unpasteurized milk and products made from it was 150 times greater than outbreaks linked to pasteurized milk, according to a study reviewing dairy product outbreaks from 1993 to 1996 in all 50 states published by the Centers for Disease Control in March of 12. Of 12. <coughs> um, it's pretty simple. I grew up on raw milk. <coughs> It'll take care of itself because once somebody gets sick from it, they're going to probably quit doing it. <laughs> but the, real whole, the whole thing with raw milk is you have to drink it from the same farm. Yes. It's just like it's exactly. just like growing up in Mexico, drinking the water. If we go there and drink the water, you get sick. If you grow up on a dairy farm, or your neighbor down the road is where you get the raw milk, you'll be you'll be fine. You Unless they are switch, exactly right. Unless they switch herd. I mean, it's <laughs> you are exactly right. Which is why we, the, the Public Health Administrators Association, never oppose off the farm sales because people are going to the same farm and right. getting it. But when you're talking about selling it in the grocery store in different kinds and brands. You <coughs> can't imagine. We we were joking, but we weren't. Julie Pride, the administrator from Champaign Urbana Public Health District, said, "I'm going to have to hire four full-time nurses just to investigate all the salmonella cases that we're going to have." Mm -hmm. Let them get sick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're required by law to investigate those cases that's and that's children. Them. <laughs> Here's the really bad part about that: it is the children. Yeah. The children who have immune systems that aren't as strong as adults end up getting really sick. Let me, let me just give, take a 15 second period and tell you a little story. A few years ago, I investigated the case of a, a little boy who was, I can't remember, he was either four or five. He was preschool. <coughs> he had um, been given raw milk and developed um, E. coli and an E. coli infection. And he ended up with STEC. STEC is shigatoxin producing E. coli. The little boy, asked, during the course of our investigation, ended up on dialysis mm -hmm. and it lost his kidney. People do not, you know, he didn't die, so, so of course it wasn't big, huge news, you know, it would have been great to see huge news that the poor child died. But he, the, the, the risk that people take in drinking raw milk, um, they don't realize it. You have a whole group of millennials, and, and I'm just going to be honest and say this. Boy, be careful about putting this in the paper, Wendy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to sound bad. But you've got a group of men that, that are into natural and organic, right. and they want to, they don't realize that they're going to hurt their own children. That has nothing to do with the natural part, has nothing to do with the pasture. Exactly. But they don't understand it. And then there's another <laughs> step in there, people don't understand it's homogenizing milk. So you can get the nice, fresh, creamy milk that's just not homogenized, but it's been pasteurized. Right. Pasteurized is just, I think, heating it to one. It is. One forty degrees. It is. You know, and I tell people that when somebody says, well, oh, oh, I don't care if my milk's not pasteurized, and I say, okay, put it this way. Would you go to a, a pond, and you know that the pond's full of bacteria, and would you drink the water out of the pond without boiling it? Mm -hmm. And they said, no. I said, well, then why would you do that with your milk? But you could if you drank it all your life. But if you drank it all your life. No, yeah. really, it's correct. Mm-hmm. My husband is a typical example of that. He grew up with a farmer, with a grandfather who milked their own cows. Mm -hmm. He drank that milk all the time. And he got used to it. Your and system it forms your own antibodies. But it's not going to happen, like Troy said. If you are selling out the store and you're buying from different, yeah. you know, yeah. So it's it's very 
it's very concerning. So I, I, um, so what's the reason for them wanting to do that in the first place? Um, to have it bill. Yeah, the money. That's, of course, that's what it is. Um, so I have contacted the legislators. Um, I've sent letters. My staff has, has um, filled out state witness slips um, opposing this bill. It's going to be heard today. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what's going to happen with it. I really don't. Um, the public health administrators and public health staff across the state of Illinois are strongly opposing this. Um, as you can see, um, there are a lot of organizations opposing this. You know, you've got the CDC, you've got um, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, you've got the American Medical Association. Um, so that's a lot of yeah, special interests. It is. No, believe it or not, the one organization that's supporting this that shocked me was um, ADH <laughs> as a group, as a as a you know, because really? they, they think, well, if people want to, they should be allowed to. It's just going to cause a lot more work for local health departments. And not, that's not, like, uh, we're not opposing it because we're afraid of having to do a lot more investigations and a lot more work. Right. We're opposing it because it's our job to prevent the spread of diseases. Right. So, hmm. we'll see what happens. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any old business to come before the committee? Any new business? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. <coughs> so moved. It's been moved by Barb, second by Jim to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Meeting adjourned.